Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to be discussing the biosynthetic pathway for vitamin D. Vitamin D is a hormone that we need for a variety of purposes, and we can get it from one of two sources. Number one, we can get it through the diet. So for example, we could get it through a supplement. So there's vitamin D supplements you can buy in the drugstore. There's foods that have vitamin D in it like dairy products, eggs also have a substantial amount of vitamin D. And then the second way we can get it is through this biosynthetic pathway. And any vitamin D, really any molecule for that matter, that's made biosynthetically by our own enzymes is termed de novo, meaning we're making it from scratch. That's what de novo means. And that's what we're going to be looking at here. This molecule over here on the right side of the screen, this is 7-dehydrocholesterol. 7-dehydrocholesterol is really the final intermediate in cholesterol synthesis before we actually get cholesterol. So you can see cholesterol biosynthesis over here, it's implied. We get 7-dehydrocholesterol, and then we have this enzyme shown here called 7-dehydrocholesterol reductase, and this converts 7-dehydrocholesterol into mature cholesterol. Now, cholesterol biosynthesis is an extremely long, convoluted pathway. In fact, if you try to Google an image of cholesterol biosynthesis, it's so long that generally most images actually omit many steps. Very long pathway. Now, why do I tell you all this? Well, it's because 7-dehydrocholesterol is the precursor to vitamin D. So as we're going through cholesterol biosynthesis and we get to 7-dehydrocholesterol, this molecule has one of two choices. It can either react with 7-dehydrocholesterol reductase to give cholesterol, which primarily occurs in the liver, or it can proceed into vitamin D synthesis, and these next two reactions occur in the epidermis, in the skin. Okay? Now, what's interesting about these first two reactions in vitamin D synthesis is they're non-enzymatic. They require no protein, no enzyme. In fact, all they require is the sun. You've often heard that you need to get your vitamin D, so go out and play in the sunlight. This is precisely why. So the first reaction uh, converts 7-dehydrocholesterol into what we call pre-vitamin D or pre-vitamin D3. The type of vitamin D that humans synthesize is D3 specifically. There's other types that you can obtain from plant sources that'll work. Um, but this is the kind that's made in humans. And this reaction requires the light component of the sun. Now the sun emits UV light, and we're specifically looking at any wavelength between 290 nanometers and 315 nanometers. And so this first reaction is a light-dependent reaction. If you don't have sufficient UV light, you don't get sufficient conversion of 7-dehydrocholesterol into pre-vitamin D. And this is a problem in very high latitudes, especially Alaska and northern Canada, because there's times of the year when it's mostly dark and the sun only comes out for maybe one or two hours. And so those individuals are at much higher risk of vitamin D deficiency because there's less UV light that they're exposed to. And so people like that in those environments would probably benefit from a UV lamp that they can sit under for maybe 15 minutes a day or something like that. The second reaction here requires heat, and you can certainly get heat from the sun. You can also get heat from a lot of other sources. It just requires heat. The sun is just a good way to get that. But it converts pre-vitamin D3 non-enzymatically into cholecalciferol, which you see right here. This cholecalciferol is sometimes termed vitamin D. If you look this up on the internet, on Google Images or something, it sometimes is called vitamin D. What's important to understand is that it would have to be termed inactive vitamin D. Okay, This is not yet active. Okay, And so for that reason, I'm choosing to term it its chemical name, cholecalciferol. Uh, if you read about this in a biochemistry textbook, it'll most likely be written as cholecalciferol. Okay? Now at this point, these two reactions not only are non-enzymatic, they both require the sun, and they both occur in the skin at the level of the epidermis. Once we've formed cholecalciferol, this is actually going to travel in the blood uh, bound to specific binding proteins that can pick up vitamin D, and they're going to travel to the liver. And in the liver, there's an enzyme, it's actually a P450 enzyme, called 25-hydroxylase. And basically what it does is it takes cholecalciferol at this point right there where my mouse is, and it adds a hydroxyl group. 
right here. And so the resulting molecule we would term 25-hydroxy cholecalciferol because this carbon right there is the 25 position. Now, this molecule can also be called calcidiol, um, and the diol comes from the fact that there's one hydroxyl group that we added, and there's a residual one down here that was part of 7-dehydrocholesterol. You can see that hydroxyl group right there. But this is calcidiol. Now, once 25-hydroxycholacalciferol is made in the liver, it then is bound to binding proteins. It travels in the blood to the kidneys where it reacts with another P450 enzyme called 1-hydroxylase. This is going to hydroxylate calcidiol at the 1 position, and we get this molecule, which is 1,25-dihydroxycholacalciferol. And because it has three hydroxyl groups at this point, we usually just call it calcitriol. And calcitriol is the active form of vitamin D. So sometimes, as I mentioned, you'll see cholecalciferol written as vitamin D. Uh, that is a vitamin D that you can get through the diet. And so when you consume vitamin D3 and get it from the diet, it is cholecalciferol, but it's inactive. When we're talking about the active form of vitamin D, it is the 125-dihydroxycholecalciferol, or calcitriol. This is active vitamin D which can then bind to the vitamin D receptor, which we typically term VDR for short. Now, calcitriol, or active vitamin D, has many different effects all throughout the body, but in general, it promotes sensitivity to insulin. We know that in type 2 diabetes, there is loss of sensitivity or insulin resistance. Well, having adequate amounts of active vitamin D will promote peripheral insulin sensitivity, so the cells in the periphery will be better at taking up glucose and helping to maintain blood sugar levels at an appropriate level. Also, vitamin D is anti-inflammatory, so it helps to modulate the immune response to prevent inflammation from getting out of whack. And it also helps balance serum lipids like LDL, HDL, and triglycerides. Obviously, if you have a deficiency of calcitriol or vitamin D, then these three things go in the opposite direction. So you're going to have more insulin resistance. There will be more inflammation and more dyslipidemia where your serum lipids are more out of balance, uh, sort of like your LDL is too high, HDL is too low, and triglycerides are too high. Now, obviously, a vitamin D deficiency is bad, but one of the ways you can circumvent that, other than dietary sources, is actually getting adequate amounts of sunlight, as we talked about at the start of the video. Now, what is the nature of the vitamin D receptor? A little bit on that. Well, calcitriol is a hydrophobic molecule. Yes, it has three hydroxyl groups, but it's very hydrophobic, very lipophilic. So it's not going to be soluble in water. In fact, we already talked about how when these molecules travel in the blood, they have to be bound to a vitamin D binding protein. And so the receptor for this molecule is not going to be on the plasma membrane. In fact, it's going to be inside the nucleus. So this right here is the nucleus, purple thing is the nucleolus, and then here of course is the DNA. And so what has to happen is calcitriol, which is this D right here, vitamin D, has to bind to what's called a vitamin D receptor. So vitamin D receptors are normally kind of floating in the cytoplasm, and calcitriol crosses the plasma membrane of the cell. It goes from the extracellular fluid into the cytoplasm, and then the vitamin D receptor picks up vitamin D, or calcitriol. Once vitamin D is bound to its vitamin D receptor, there's another protein that will then bind to form what we call a heterodimer. Hetero meaning different, and there's two proteins, so a dimer, of the vitamin D receptor and this RXR, which is what we call the retinoid X receptor. Once we've formed this complex of the VDR, RXR, and vitamin D, or calcitriol, then this complex will translocate into the nucleus. And let's see what actually happens there. So here's our complex. It's going to translocate into the nucleus, and you see that it actually binds to specific regions of the DNA termed VDRE. This stands for vitamin D response elements. So in order for vitamin D to cause any gene expression and have any kind of physiological changes, this complex has to bind to these very specific regions of the DNA, the vitamin D response elements. Once this complex is bound here, it allows the recruitment of other proteins such as RNA polymerase, which then can transcribe the DNA and produce mRNA that's related to vitamin D. 
And of course, that mRNA leaves the nucleus, goes into the cytoplasm, and is translated to proteins. And then these proteins are what ultimately produce the cellular effects, which then produce system-wide effects, like anti-inflammation, insulin sensitization, and serum lipid balance that we talked about before. Okay. Now, one quick thing before we conclude this video, and it has to do with statin medications. We talked about statin medications in other videos. You can certainly search on my channel statins or cardiovascular medications or something like that. But remember, statins inhibit the enzyme HMG-CoA reductase. Now, if you don't know what that enzyme is, that's fine, but understand that HMG-CoA reductase is an enzyme very early in cholesterol biosynthesis. We mentioned that's a very long pathway. HMG-CoA reductase is actually, I believe, the third enzyme in the pathway. It's very early, okay? If you were to take a statin, which inhibits that enzyme, what happens to cholesterol biosynthesis? Well, it drops, right? You're not gonna be making any cholesterol yourself. So de novo cholesterol synthesis goes sharply down. And that theoretically is the goal of statin therapy. If somebody has high LDL, right, you wanna bring the LDL down. And so statin medications reduce cholesterol synthesis, which in turn reduces LDL. But these statins have a lot of side effects. Let's think about it. If we're shutting off HMG-CoA reductase, we're shutting off cholesterol biosynthesis. So what's gonna to happen to the quantities of 70 hydrocholesterol? Well, that's going to drop. Right? Cholesterol is going to drop, of course, but it's because 70 hydrocholesterol, the precursor to it, is going to drop. If 70 hydrocholesterol drops, all of this synthesis is going to drop. In other words, if we take a statin medication, not only are we turning off cholesterol synthesis, but we're also turning off vitamin D synthesis. And so the actual de novo vitamin D that a person is gonna be able to make is gonna go markedly down on a statin medication. And so the implication of that is that if you're not making it de novo, you better be getting it through the diet. Uh, meaning you're gonna to have to take cholecalciferol, the inactive vitamin D, through the diet. And again, sources that might include eggs, dairy products, you can certainly look those up online, there's plenty of them. But you have to get vitamin D through the diet. You can't rely on this pathway because with a statin medication, you're not getting any 70 hydrocholesterol, right? The synthesis is shut down. So this molecule's out, and so the whole pathway is out. Okay, so just wanted to cover that really quick clinical application. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the clinical application and the pathway for vitamin D synthesis. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.